Hello. I'd like to welcome you to a presentation uh, on problem solving on behalf of Kangaroo Canada. Uh, my name is Bryce Watson and I'll be your problem solver today. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. So today we will look at five questions selected from three tests from previous years. Uh, each problem will be introduced with a key to solving the problem, followed by an interactive demonstration of the solution. So there's going to be a couple of animations, uh, nothing too crazy, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Remember that these questions require you to think a little bit outside of the box. Um, I'm going to be honest, uh, not all of them came to me immediately, and um, so don't feel bad if you know it doesn't come immediately to you either. Uh, you're going to also have to really just remember a couple things about arithmetic and algebra, odd and even numbers, stuff like that, which I'm going to remind you of in the keys to solving the problem. So, let's start with question 10 from the 2008 Canada Math Kangaroo Contest. So, there are five boxes, pictured below is one, two, three, four, five, and each box contains some cards labeled A, B, R, O, and V. In this instance, we just put the letters themselves, but imagine the, the uh, letters are the cards. So, we have a guy named Peter who wants to remove the cards from the boxes in such a way that at the end, each box contains only one card, and different boxes contain cards with different letters. Um, and then at the end of this process, uh, we're asked what card remains in box five. Now, there's a couple different options, which we'll get to once we get to the solution set. But basically, the key to solving the problem is you must start with the box that has one card. You then remove that card from all other boxes and repeat this process. Eventually, you're going to reach a point when there's only one card left in box five <clears throat> and you'll be able to answer the problem okay so let's start with the only box that has a singular card in it that would be box four now the goal is to remove cards until there's one single unique card in each box since there's no more possible cards to remove from four without it having no cards its unique card will be V, which means that we need to remove all the V's from all the other boxes, which we'll do now. Okay, we see that that move just opened up a new box that has only one card. Now, again, we can't remove any more cards. B is going to have to be the unique card for our uh, first box. So that means we need to remove the B's from all the other boxes right now. Okay. So now, uh, the same case happens again with bo uh, box three, which now has A, which means no other boxes can have A. Let's take them out. And now, with box two, we're only left with R, so that means R cannot exist in box five. Removing this last letter, or this last card, pardon me, from box five, we see the only card left in box five after applying this process is O. So that means the answer to the question is D. Oh. Moving on to the 2010 assessment, we look at question six. There are seven bars in the box on the picture. It is possible to slide the bars in the box that there will be room for one more bar. At least how many bars have we moved? And you'll see that the box that we're looking at is pictured on the right here. So the key to solving this problem is to visualize the blocks moving in your mind and to see if you can find a combination of moves leaving space for another. So this is really important in lots of math and science. You really need to have really good visualization skills. Okay, let's get to it. They recreate the box and the bars. I'm sorry for my non-neatness. And right away we see that there's two blocks that can move uh, on their own. So we're going to start off by trying to move two of them. But however, we see this space cannot fit a bar based on looking at the bar below it. So we have to replace the bars back to where they came from. But another orientation would be if we move the top bar like this and the bottom one like that. So now we see, based on the bar below this space, that it's obvious that a bar can fit in this space. 
So that means it only takes two moves to add a new bar to this space. That means the answer is B. So sticking with the 2010 test, let's look at the very next question, question 11. The numbers 1, 4, 7, 10, and 13 are to be arranged in the cells of the cross seen to our right so that the sum of the three numbers in the row equals the sum of the three numbers in the column. There is more than one arrangement that satisfies this rule, but we want to know what's the greatest possible sum of numbers in the row, which would be the same as the sum of numbers in the column. So the key to solving this problem is to choose which numbers can be in the middle cell numbers by determining which would leave two pairs with equal sum. So basically, you take one of the five numbers out. Do the remaining four numbers allow for two pairs to be made where the pairs have equal sums? Um, and an important skill to remember here is that an odd number plus an odd number is equal to odd. An even number plus an even number is equal to an even number. And an even plus an odd is equal to an odd. So uh, two numbers don't work for the middle, which are 10 and 4, because they're even numbers. If you remove one, you'll be left with three odds and an even, which gives you overall an odd number, which cannot be divis uh, divided into two equal sums. So there's no way we can uh, place them into the cross accordingly. But 7, 1, and 13 work because when, by inspection, you'll see that when each of these is taken out, the four remaining numbers give you an even number that's divisible by 2, meaning that you can have two equal sums. So if we put 13 in the middle, we find that the row sum is 24. If we switch it around and put 1 in the middle, we'll see that the row sum is 18. And finally, if we place 7 in the middle, we'll get a row sum of 21. It's obvious that when you place 13 in the middle, you get the highest row sum. So the answer to the question is E. Okay, moving on to question 22 from the 2009 test. We have that in a 4 by 2 table, two numbers are written in the first row. Each row after the first one contains the sum and difference of the numbers with the for what written in the previous row. See the table. So we see that obviously the left box in each row is the sum and the right box is the difference. In another 7 by 2 table constructed in the same way, the numbers of the last row are 96 and 64. What is the sum of the numbers in the first row? So the key to solving this problem is to choose two variables for the starting two numbers and then basically we're going to work through seven rows of this process. One column is the sum, the other is the difference. Basically just rewriting these variables until finally we get to seven rows of this process. And we take the variables from the seventh line, and the numbers given, 96 and 64, um, which are supposed to be the sum and difference of that row, and solve for the two variables. Okay, so we're going to choose two variables for the first two numbers, which will be A and B. And now let's get right into the process of putting their sum below on the left and their difference on the right. So A plus B is going to be the sum, and A minus B will obviously be the difference. Now, continuing, and the next one below, A plus B plus A minus B would equal 2A. And A plus B minus A minus B remember that this would become minus a plus b, would actually give you 2b. Below that, we would have 2a plus 2b for the sum, 2a minus 2b for the difference. And then below that, we would have 4a for the sum and 4b for the difference. Below that, we would have 4a plus 4b for the sum and 4a minus 4b for the difference. And finally, for the seventh row, we would have 8a for the sum and 8b for the difference. This is quite easy, you can work this out yourself. And anyway, now we're gonna look and try to solve for A and B. We find that A is equal to 12 and B is equal to eight. So the sum of these is 20. Therefore, the answer of our question is D. So we've arrived at our last question for today, question 23 from the 2009 test. 
In the land of funny feet, everyone has the left foot one size or two sizes bigger than the right foot. Nevertheless, shoes are sold in pairs of the same size. To save money, a group of friends plans to buy shoes together. Each person can take two shoes, and only a shoe of size 36 and size 35 will be left over. What must be the minimum number of people in the group for the plan to be possible? So the key to solving this problem is that the question doesn't limit how many people can actually have left feet two sizes larger, and we will use this to reduce the number of people needed to buy the shoes. We're going to use as many people with a left size two sizes bigger than the right as possible to reduce the number of people that are needed to buy shoes and still have a uh, size 36 and a size 45 left over. If we start immediately with someone with a size 36 and then a left size of 38, this removes the need of a size 37 pair altogether. Similarly, someone with a size 38 and then a left size of 40 removes the need for a 39. Someone with a size of 40 and then a left size of 42 removes the need of a 41. And someone with a size 42 and a size left size 44 removes the need for a 43. We add one more person with a size difference of one size uh, between their left and right feet to take one of the 44s and one of the 45s. Overall this leaves us with a 36 and a 45. So we see how many people did this take us. Well there's three line there's five lines here but six pairs of shoes but it didn't say anything about how many pairs of shoes we could buy with the number of people. The number of people actually wearing shoes is five, so that means it only took us five people to do this. So the answer to this question is A, five. Well, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. See you later.